Welcome back to another episode of the Hardcore Casual with your boy, Base the Kid. As usual, please like and subscribe, click that notification so that you get the updates of when these videos drop. They should be coming out more regularly moving forward. Apologies for a delay, there was supposed to be a couple additional ones this week, but things happen. Anyway, we move and let's get into some of the talking points from this week. So it's official, Errol Spence Jr. versus Eudenis Ugas has been uh, confirmed and it will be taking place on the 16th of April or April 16th if you're in the US. Um, I think it's in, happening in Texas at the AT&T Stadium. Now look, I'm one of the first people to give Errol Spence shit for ducking that Crawford smoke. Widely publicised, I believe he's been ducking from day one and whatnot, whatnot. However, there was some kind of movement that was potentially supposed to be going ahead about boycotting this fight in protest of not getting that fight. Now, I'm not with that. Simply because at the end of the day, your Dennis Ugas ain't got nothing to do with the dramas between Errol Spence and Terence Crawford. And he deserves to get his chance. Now, I don't think he should have got the chance first, realistically, but he did get the Pacquiao fight. He did do the work that Keith Furman didn't do, the work that Errol Spence was supposed to do prior to the eye injury. So, at the end of the day, like, I can't begrudge him getting his getting his just dues right now. So big up to you, Dennis Ugas. And you know what? I'ma even give Errol Spence Jr. some credit as well because this is a very, very dangerous fight to be taken off of a year in activity and a recent eye injury. So I'll give him respect for that. Um, probably be pay-per-view in the US. Uh, chances I will end up on Fight TV over here If it does, I'll buy it If it ends up being on one of the channels BT Sports, Sky Sports Then hey, happy days But um, look, it's a good fight It's not the fight we wanted But it's not a bad substitute either So, provided everything goes off without a hitch Like, we finally got it So let's just enjoy it And let's let the build up take place I guess moving on. So Eddie Hearn has um, said that the potential opponents for Conor Ben's next fight, um, Adrian Broner, Chris Van Heerden, and he said, and a couple others, he didn't give specific names. So realistically, it's gonna be Chris Van Heerden. And apparently Chris has already agreed to the fight. Um, they're waiting for some other contracts to potentially come back, but more than likely, I think that's going to be the next fight and to be honest that was the fight that was touted before the Algeria fight came out bef um, you know the end of last year um, and I think the only reason that didn't happen is because um, Van Heerden was still recovering from the, the nasty head clash that he got with um, Jaron Ennis even though that happened the year before but it was a really bad cut like if you guys haven't seen that fight Go watch it. Um, now, look, with regards to this fight, I, I don't mind it at all. I'll tell you why. Like, Chris, uh, I mean, Conor Ben, sorry, he's still on the path of growing. He's still learning. Now, this just gives him another facet to have to deal with. Like, he's got a guy in Chris Van Heerden who's actually very durable. South African. It's a South poor which uh, as far as I'm aware like Connor ain't really dealt with too many of them previously so that in itself is a good test for him um, he's got average power but he's got a pretty good work rate um, and he's tough to a degree like he's he's going to be more durable than Algeria was and He's definitely not going to run like a couple, couple of Connor's other opponents. <laughs> so, I think it's a fine fight. 
I mean, the Maurice Hooker fight was brilliant. Unfortunately, obviously, he got injured apparently on the second day of his training. So, wish him a speedy recovery. But his body looks like it's breaking down on him right now. So, this could be like last legs for, for Mighty Mo. Um, but that was my, my fight of choice. Um, but yeah, ultimately, look, Van Heerden, it's not a bad fight. It's going to be under the zone as part of a subscription. Like, it's not a pay per view. It's not going to be on the undercard of a of, uh, pay-per-view um, that I'm aware of. So, you know what? It's all right. It's fine. Um, so it'll be a good learning, building, step, stepping stone fight. Um, the only bad thing about it is the fact that Van Heerden's been out the ring for what, a year and a half. Maybe a bit more. Uh, I can't remember exactly when that fight was against Boots and his spot. It's cool. So... Look, I'll accept it. I'll be fine with it. I just want to see something, um, something a bit better. Uh, you know, another step up progression after this one. And you know what? I know everyone's going to talk about Avanesian. I won't get into the rant right now, but I'm tired of hearing Avanesian's name being linked with Conor Ben. If I'm honest with you, maybe I'll address that on another video. But for right now, that's that. So Eddie Hearn's come out and said that Devin Haney is prepared to go to Australia. Um, they've officially now sent an offer to George Cambosis' team for a fight in Australia. Now the question is, is this the first offer that they've sent period or is this just the first one to finally agree to the fight being staged over there? Because the fight between Cambosis and Lopez happened in November last year and Haney fought in December and was still waiting for this same fight which was supposedly fairly easy to make and you know George and Haney was talking oh yeah now we can talk after after Campos after um, Haney had his fight against Jojo Diaz so look it's good news it's either going to be um, Haney or it's going to be um Lomachenko that seems to be the the method of thought the Ryan Garcia thing is being touted as an outside possibility but it definitely won't be for now which means that it has to be either Lomachenko or Haney because George wouldn't get a, um, a Ryan Garcia fight before September October since Ryan's going to be boxing in April against um, Emmanuel to go so like let's hurry up and get one of those fights over the line um there seems to have been a contract done by both sides now um when i'm talking about lomachenko's side and devin haney's side so it's all about which one george takes and to me whichever one he takes says a lot about him personally like if he takes haney then that's undisputed like regardless of what we think or what well not me personally what other people think about Haney's WBC belt how he got it who he's defended it against and all of that and the whole franchise rubbish that Cambosis has got like that just means that everything gets amalgamated and put into one pot and there's no longer any kinds of disputes about who the number one who the number one is and who's the undisputed is if he picks Loma well then that tells me that it could be more of a I guess maybe a, a cash grab I'm not sure so if that fight makes more but it gets him the opportunity I suppose to be on ESPN over here instead of an app like The Zone um, when I say over here like I'm in America sorry over there yeah um, you get a chance to be on the, the big ESPN uh, platform probably not even a subscription service because we know Lomachenko always seems to go to mainstream ESPN but you're more than likely going to lose all them belts so I mean out of the two I would assume that Devin Haney would be the slightly easier opponent in terms of probability of being able to beat however there's a reason nobody wants to seem to fight him so it, it's clearly must be a much harder night in the office than people are expecting um, but yeah I just want to kind of get that over and done with so that we can all move on to, to what's next we can crown it undisputed or we can find out exactly where Cambosis' priorities are 
Um, but the, yeah, hopefully that talking stops fairly soon because it is getting a bit boring, if I'm being honest. Tyson Fury has said to now have signed his contract for the Dillian White mandatory fight happening on the 23rd of April. But apparently there's not been anything signed by Dillian White yet. <sighs> That's exactly how I feel about the situation. Uh, everyone making a big deal about it. Look, at the end of the day, Dillian's got two options. He's either gonna sign the contract or he's not. If he doesn't sign the contract, neither myself nor anyone that I know is gonna be giving him any more, oh, woe is me, like, why did they treat Dillian so bad situation like look he's been dealt a shit hand by the WBC the 80 20 has been disgusting we all know we've all spoken about it but at the end of the day like what you wanted was the title shot right so is it really about the shot or is it about the money I'm not speculating that he is thinking money or, or anything like that I'm just saying like if you've been campaigning for the shot the shots here like realistically when it comes to certain things and being put in certain positions, you have to be willing to take short money or no money for an opportunity that could ultimately change your life. I mean, most people have done it at work before. You, you've got a certain value, but when certain things don't happen or opportunities get presented to you, which may benefit you long term, sometimes you take less money than you really think you deserve. I mean, I know I've done that in the past. so. Um, yeah he's either going to sign it or he's not now if he does sign it cool like why is everyone so worried about him talking like at the end of the day he don't have to talk it as as Eddie Hearn said as other people have said Dillian White gets nothing from promoting this fight he only gets something from taking part in it so him spending energy going back and forth with either Tyson Fury or any of his fans or any of his colleagues, friends, associates and people on Twitter and Instagram and interviews. It's energy he doesn't need to be wasting right now. He's got he's still got the arbitration in the background. So I don't know if, if he's even under some some kind of gag order which basically prevents him from saying certain things up until the point where the, the decision's read out. Or maybe he's just literally, this is his biggest ever fight right about now. There's nothing happening that is bigger than this. He, there's, whether he's injured or he's not, he's just got to crack down and, and deal with it. So realistically, at this stage, yeah, like I said, it's one or, it's one or the two. If he doesn't sign, then none of us can feel sorry for him anymore. If he does sign, happy days and as I said he's not getting anything additional by promoting this fight so hell hell yeah like let Frank and let Bob and let Tyson do all the work and find out exactly how much of a star they that team is how, how you know how big a star Tyson Fury is how good of a promoter Bob Arum is how relevant Frank Warren still is like let them do the work Eddie's not involved because they don't want him to be involved but people still want to talk and ask him about the fight because it drums up clicks and, and interest but Eddie's not going to do anything outside of whatever Dillian may, might ask him to do Dillian might not even be talking with Eddie too tough right about now he, he might be looking to go back to Sky and be the number one guy with Boxer he might look to go over to the PBC and go reign supreme in the US and take on Charles Martin and Luis Ortiz and just take bad, you know, quick paydays against like these no hope, the no hope heavyweights over there at the moment. He might finally get the Andy Ruiz fight that he wanted. Who knows? But yeah, like Tyson signed his side now apparently. So cool. Wait for Dillian. He's got until the 21st. So what's that? Oh, another week and a bit, 10 days. Yeah, cool. It's all good. Um, nothing else to say on that. If you guys got anything you wanna you you wanna add to it, you know where to leave it. On to the next one. So, Filip Perkovic finally got an opponent for the IBF. Supposedly. I mean, Zile Zhang, who we've been speaking about for the last few weeks over here with the hardcore casual, said he would take the fight. 
went down to him and Dempsey McKean. Now Dempsey McKean was already scheduled to fight someone, so that was his get out clause for that. Zile Zhang has accepted. Um, now they're doing the negotiations prior to potential purse bids, but he's accepted the fight. Quite frankly, he's what 38 now. It, there was if he if he said no to this, there was probably no chance he would get the opportunity before he ends up being 40, and you know, a even more sort of faded version of what he could be. But he's a good, he's an he's an ex Olympian. Uh, you know pretty decent amateur for you know for his size um you know representing the whole uh you know the whole whole country of china so he's very heavy-handed and he's pretty he's got pretty good technical skills he just he's a bit slow but he's not too bad when it comes to being defensively responsible um and he's got a, he's got a very powerful um sweeping right hook and a straight left from his southpaw stance. So if Filip Pergovic has been looking a bit lethargic and sloppy in his previous his previous fights and coming in a bit overweight, I think he needs to train for this one. Even if it's just to make sure that he can out hustle and out maneuver Zhang. Because also Zhang is slightly taller than him with a, with a longer reach, which means that realistically Pergovic is going to have to be a bit more mobile to be able to work to make sure he can get slightly inside of that reach to let his shots go as well um, so it would be a good interesting fight as soon as it's um, signed it's probably some one that I would look to do an analysis on um, but yeah that's the news for that um, his two year stint of, of, of trying to find this opponent is now finally over provided Zhang does agree to whatever terms they put in their contract and yeah let's get that show on the road um, on to the next one so Sean Porter on the Port Away podcast labelled um, Jaron Boots Ennis as overrated now listening to that it almost sounds a bit triggering now it could have maybe been a bit click break clickbaity but when you delve deeper into what he's saying he's, he's basically said look this guy's incredibly talented but everyone's saying oh he washes this guy easy he washes that guy easy he, he beats that guy easy but what tests has he had to really make us know and believe this I mean what we got Thomas the law made last out who was a faded husk of a husk if we're gonna be honest um, I can't remember the fight he had before that. He had the uh, Van Heerden fight. Oh, was Lip it was Lippinets and Van Heerden, or was it Van Heerden and Lippinets? Either way, like these were all guys that were coming up from 140 up to sort of 147. Now he's a huge 147 anyway, so realistically he could be fighting people like more of his size and stature. But, but Porter was basically saying, well, look, he needs to be able to take these fights and actually beat these people before we can crown him like the next, that next guy. And I agree with that. You know, the whole eye test thing. Yeah, it's a cool thing to say, but it, it can only take you so far. Like there's only so much this quote unquote eye test matters. What really matters is facts and stats. Like who have you fought? When did you fight them? what level were they at where were you in your career like these are all things you kind of have to take into consideration so yeah on the eye test he looks he looks slick he's got good combos he's got good feet move he's got good foot movement good positioning um a strong you know seems to take a good punch but the problem is He's never been in there with any like huge punches for us to understand exactly how much of a good punch he can take. And if we're also going to be honest, he's a person that whenever he gets hit, he always gets hit clean. It's never a, a, fly, uh, a grazing shot. He never rides the shot. He gets hit, like he gets caught and hard. So whether he just happens to have a good chin so doesn't necessarily worry about it or they're just not 
strong enough to dent him, which I believe is probably closer to the truth. That's something that he has to work on, especially when he steps up to that next level. Um, you know, the, the new up and coming hungry stars or the guys who are on their way down, but they're not that far gone yet. Like against the Keith Furman, for instance, even though, you know, Keith doesn't really punch as hard as he used to, but you know, that kind of, that kind of level tells you where he's at realistically. Um, who's, cause Keith is, Keith isn't world, world class elite level anymore. If I'm being honest, um, you know, even if you put him in there with someone like, a actually not, let me not say that that's a bit disrespectful. Boots will kill him. Um, yeah, look, ultimately, I agree with what Sean Porter said, and I listened to it in the context he said it as well, which is why I agree. Um, he is overrated because people are overrating him based on stuff he hasn't done yet. And ultimately, that is what a lot of fans do. Like, we tend to see something and just automatically assign it to everything else without there being any evidence of it. Um, so without going into sort of a diatribe about another situation I could equate it to um, I'll say I agree with the statement but I also do think he is crazy talented as does Sean Porter and everyone else and he's basically like look we just want to see the step ups so let's keep it moving um, in terms of what he said on Twitter about calling out um, Sean Porter or come out of retirement then and fight me yeah that's that's long that's all dead that's not even really worth addressing so I'm gonna move this one on and last but most certainly not least um, it looks like Canelo Alvarez and Eddie Reynoso are mulling over two different deals at the minute one from Showtime PBC for a Jamal Charlo fight um, which he's supposed to get in the realms of 45 million dollars potentially and the other one is a two fight the zone deal where Dimitri Bivol would be the first opponent and if he can get past Dimitri Bivol at 175 and collect that WBA super um, light heavyweight title then he will go back down to 168 and fight Gennady Golovkin in a trilogy fight um, now and that one I believe is supposed to be worth between 85 and 100 million dollars um, I don't know how they've crunched those numbers and come to those figures but that's not my job um, now with regards to those two deals the easiest of them if I'm going to be honest is the Jamal Charlo fight now if Canelo wants easy work easy money as he's said to Eddie Hearn backstage numerous times personally I think that's the easiest one especially if you look at um, the dimensions and the skill set that Dimitri Bivol has stick and move he's able to negate his opponent's like advantages he's got good enough power that you're not just going to walk him down behind the high guard um, slick movement very accurate with his shots um, you know that's the sort of a nightmare for, for someone like um, Canelo whereas Jam uh, Jamal Charlo is very much more fundamentally basic um, one twos one one twos and yeah I feel like him also coming up for 160 which means that he's always been then it would have been the naturally smaller guy moving up in terms of just where he's been campaigning um everything in that fight just sort of screams easy and night now the Golovkin part you could potentially say that might be the easiest of the three fights just because of how old he has how old he is now how inactive he's been of late but the skills are always going to be the skills like the, the, the basic fundamentals are still there and he's still got power that needs to be respected at all levels so but in order to get to Golovkin you still got to get through Bivol which I still think is the hardest task so personally that's the fight I'd like to see 
just because to me it poses the most risk and danger of Canelo getting another L on his record. Um, but to be honest, whichever deal happens, provided I don't have to pay anything above, say, £20 for it, I don't mind. Um, the PBC one, will it end up on Sky Sports or BT? Probably not. It will probably end up on the Fight TV app as, again. Um, the other one, if they, I don't think they'll do that zone pay per view thing for those based on us over here. So now I think about it, yeah, let me get let me get that first because I won't have to pay anything additional for that. But whichever way it works out, um, I'm quite content. If he, you know, if he wants to beat up on on Jamal Charlo and get a quick forty million for that, cool. If he wants to have a real test and step up another weight division again against someone that's actually in their prime that is his normal kryptonite then i'll definitely be looking forward to that one as well but okay with that i'm gonna wrap this video up and i need to address what's about to happen over the weekend with danny jacobs and john Ryder. so that's going to be coming up shortly um and yeah there's probably a couple other videos that need to be um released this week coming uh like i said there's a women's one that needs to be done so i'm gonna get that sorted out but for right now i want to thank everyone for watching tuning in again like and subscribe if you enjoyed it share it with a friend who may be interested in boxing as well um, and i will see you guys soon but for right now hardcore casual out